All right, guys, so before we build our printer, we should understand exactly how one works first. Very simply, a 3D printer is a tool used to make 3D models, most commonly by melting plastic and forcing it through a heated nozzle. This nozzle can move in three dimensions, up and down, left and right, and front and back. By feeding it commands known as G-code from a program called a slicer, we can take our 3D model and cut it into hundreds or thousands of layers and then give those instructions to a 3D printer to then assemble it back into our 3D model. In these slicer programs, you can set really important parameters, things like temperatures, layer thickness, speed, infill, and a few other hundreds that we won't be touching on in this course. A really good way to think of a 3D printer is like a hot glue gun. You squeeze a trigger and a molten material is pushed through a heated nozzle that you can then draw in a straight line. As the glue cools down, it becomes hard and you can then add layer on top of layer to increase the height. Now, if you could move your hand as accurately as a robot, then you could essentially make anything you wanted. But because a 3D printer is a little bit more sophisticated than a hot glue gun, there's a little bit more information that we need to learn about types of printers and material. The most common type of 3D printer that you're likely to come across is called an FDM printer or an FFF printer, just like the Ender 3. This takes plastic, known as filament, and extrudes it to make a 3D object. Almost every type of plastic that you can think of can probably be 3D printed, but the most common ones that you'll find in the 3D printing community are PLA, PETG, and TPU. PLA, or polylactic acid, is the most beginner-friendly material that you should get started with. It's relatively inexpensive, about $25 per kilogram, and it comes in almost every color and sheen that you can imagine. It needs no extra setup from your printer, and the default slicer settings are usually perfectly fine. Now, there are more advanced PLA materials that contain abrasive material inside the plastic, and to print with these, you actually need a nozzle that's made from a hard material, something like a hardened steel or a ruby tip. These nozzles can be quite a bit more exotic materials. Things like glow-in-the-dark PLA, which actually contains strontium particles, which absorb and then emit light. There's also wood PLA, which contains real wood fibers that can be sanded, stained, and treated like real wood. Marble PLA, which contains small marble powder that makes anything you print look like it was sculpted out of a solid block of stone. There's also metal PLA, which contains small metal particles that can be buffed to a mirror shine, oxidized to form a patina, or even electroplated with gold or silver. These materials are definitely not beginner friendly, but they are so much fun to play with. It has a very low melting temperature, which means you can print very quickly on lots of different types of machines, and it doesn't need a heated enclosure like other materials like ABS. The downside to this low melting temperature quality is that unfortunately it can start to warp or even melt in really hot conditions. If you design something like a phone holder for your car and you print it in black PLA, which is gonna absorb a lot of sunlight, then it's actually very likely to warp or melt if you leave your car in the sun on a hot day. If you want a material that can handle those higher temperatures, then you need to graduate up to PETG or polyethylene terephthalate polyeth or poly polyethylene terephthalate glycol yeah this is a very common material to find in the manufacturing space because it's used all the time in plastic engineering to make water bottles, which is why all the 3D prints that you'll get off of it are gonna be ever so slightly clear and transparent. This is a fairly tricky material to work with because it wants to form all of these plastic cobwebs known as stringing. This can be dialed in with your printer to make sure that all of your prints come out perfect though. Once you conquer PETG, the next material that you should play around with is called TPU, or thermal polyurethane. That's the same stuff that a lot of flexible phone cases are made of. TPU can be found in a whole range of hardness to stretchiness, 
But the most common for 3D printing is called 85A. That's the same rubberiness as a car tire. Now this could be difficult to print with on a stock Ender 3, but it is technically doable. If you successfully print objects with this material, then all of your prints are essentially indestructible and can be used all over 3D printing for living hinges, car tires, phone cases, and even running shoes. The solution to a lot of the problems with TPU is to use a direct drive system, which we'll talk about a little bit later in our build. There's lots of really fun material to play around with on an FFF 3D printer, so just pick up a kilogram of PLA and start printing. Now an FFF printer is just one type of 3D printer, but there are lots of different types of printers that use lots of really strange materials. Another common type in the hobby space is an SLA printer, or a stereolithography, that instead of using melting plastic, uses a liquid resin that is cured by a UV emitting screen. Instead of melting plastic on top of each other, an SLA printer cures a layer of resin, moves upwards, lets the liquid flow underneath, and then continues this over and over and over again to build up a 3D model. Because of this, it actually prints upside down and pulls your 3D object out of a bath of liquid. If you're as old as me, then you will definitely remember the 1998 film Small Soldiers, where in the opening credit, they actually used one of the original prototype SLA 3D printers to make the Small Soldiers for the film. Obviously, how they show it being made in the film isn't exactly how it would look in real life, but as you can see, the final object is in fact 3D printed. If you look closely enough in the film, you'll actually see that it still has some support structure still clinging onto the model. The advantage of these printers is that you can get an incredible amount of accuracy out of it. Instead of relying on the movement of a motor, you can now utilize the high resolution of a screen, which can go up to 8K resolution to give you a phenomenal part. The downside of these printers is that the resin and alcohol that you'd need to make your objects can give off some really nasty noxious fumes if you're not in a well-ventilated area. It also requires a lot more post-processing than an FFF machine, because as soon as a resin part is done, it needs to be washed in alcohol to remove the outer layer of uncured resin, and then put inside a UV curing station to cure the outer layer and make sure the entire part is as hard and solidified as possible. These printers are really fun to mess around with, but if you plan on picking one up, don't forget to pick up a respirator and some safety glasses. Continuing on, another type of 3D printer that's a little bit more rare is a powder printer. These printers used a powderized plastic or metal to fuse together layer by layer to make incredibly complicated parts that you wouldn't normally be able to make using traditional manufacturing techniques. One of these type of powder printers is called binder jetting, which sprays a little bit of resin over some powderized plastic to get it to fuse together. This works in a really similar way to a normal inkjet printer that you have in your office, but instead of squirting out a little bit of ink, it's squirting out a little bit of curable resin. The advantage of these printers is that you can make incredibly delicate parts, because as soon as you solidify an area, it's completely encapsulated and supported by a bath of powder. And because we can treat it just like an inkjet printer, you can add colorants to the outer layer to make it whatever color you want. Another type of these powder printers is called SLM, or Selective Laser Melting, which uses a laser beam to melt metal powder to form a solid metal part. This is a super cool use of the technology and it's being used right now to make rocket combustion chambers, wind turbines, and medical implants. It's really cool, but please don't expect to see this on the shelves anytime soon, because unfortunately, powderized metal is incredibly flammable. These printing chambers need to be filled with an inert gas, or else when you fire a laser beam at a bunch of powderized metal, you're very likely to end up with a fireball. As you can probably see, the world of 3D printing becomes very, very fun very, very quickly, but it's a better idea to dig in a little bit deeper and see where this technology can take us. Fundamentally, a 3D printer is a CNC machine, or computer numerical control. It's essentially just a robot that's been given movements from a computer. 
Now, before we had CNC machines, we had NC machines or numerical control, where a machine had to be programmed line by line by a human to perform just one task. If you've ever seen one of those old Western movies where they have a piano that's playing itself and it has that reel of paper with hole punches cut out of it, that's technically an NC machine. Before we had modern computers, software engineers literally used to have to feed in punch cards into these computers to get any computational information out of it. My dad was actually one of those early engineers that would feed punch cards into machines to do financing work for different companies. So coming from that early technology, we now have computers that can do the work for us, which is why you see a huge explosion in CNC machines. Things like CNC mills, CNC routers, plasma cutters, water jet cutters, and so many other different types of machines. One of the first 3D printers was developed by Chuck Hull and was an SLA printer, which currently resides in the National Inventor Hall of Fame Museum in Virginia. Much like all other groundbreaking inventions like photography, the light bulb, the telephone, it's actually fairly hard to definitively say who invented it first. But for ease of use, we'll just say that Chuck got there first, even though there are several of fantastic engineers that made huge strides in the early days of 3D printing. But what was Chuck's first 3D print? Well, it was this, a small plastic cup. But what is it? Well, it's a little eyewash cup. Essentially, you would fill up this little inside cavity with some water and you would use it to flush out your eye if you had any contaminant or irritant in it. Not the most exciting thing in the world, but this is the genesis of every single 3D printed thing in the world today. From this, Chuck went on to co-found one of the most successful and longest 3D printing companies in the world, 3D Systems. At around the turn of the century, we saw a cultural opening for hobbyists to now legally make their own 3D printing companies. These early printers were literally made from scrap wood and bolts and threaded rods that you would get from the hardware store. Thankfully though, this started a really lovely sharing of information culture within the 3D printing world, where if a hobbyist solved a really difficult problem, instead of hoarding that information, they would give it out to the community. So the entire world of 3D printing got better and better and better at an exponential rate. In the present, we have gotten so good at 3D printing that there's now several types of 3D printers that are essentially plug and play that will give you fantastic results and be able to print in multiple materials at the same time. Kit builds like the Ender 3 are now so accessible that you can find one in almost every single public library and school across the country. Looking to the future, you'll see more and more 3D printing parts coming into the medical and dental field as technology and material physics gets better and better. We're also likely to see a growth of RepRap machines. These are self-replicating 3D printers that are able to print a 3D printer. As the years go by, we should be expecting to see these perfect self-replicating robots coming in the very near future. Hey guys, thank you very much for checking out our video. If you want to learn more about 3D printing and all the fantastic things that you can make with them, then you can check out our full course 3D printing masterclass in the description or at cadclass.org.